as Neville Kennard indicated, I want to break up my speech in, into two parts, uh, have a little break in between. Uh, the first one is, so to speak, more critical, and then people always expect to do something constructive. Um, so I hope to say something constructive about what is the alternative to the state. But first, I want to, in the first part of this speech, I want to deal with what states, what states are. Um, and even before that, uh, I want to explain what I consider to be um, the problem of, of social order. Um, and begin with very elementary considerations. Uh, imagine uh, Robinson Crusoe alone on his, on his island. Um, he, of course, can do whatever he uh, pleases, because for him the question uh, concerning rules of orderly human conduct simply does not arise. Um, this question can obviously only arise if a second person, uh, Friday, appears on the scene. Um, yet even if we have two people, Crusoe and Friday, um, the question of what are the rules of human conduct would remain largely irrelevant as long as there is no scarcity. Uh, imagine, for instance, um, that we inhabit the Garden of Eden, um, where all external goods exist in, in superabundance. There's no scarcity of them. Whatever we want, we can have. Uh, these goods are, so to speak, free goods, just as the air that we breathe in and out is is a free good. Um, whatever Crusoe does with these goods, his actions have absolutely no repercussions on Friday, what Friday can do, and the actions of Friday have no repercussions uh, on the actions of Robinson Crusoe because everything exists in superabundance. Um, because of this, it is to a large extent impossible that a conflict regarding the use of different goods could arise between Friday and Crusoe. Um, because for a conflict to be possible, um, it is necessary that a good is scarce, that there are not enough goods around. Um, and only if there is scarcity do there exist a need uh, to formulate rules of orderly human conduct. Only because of conflicts do we need rules. Um, now, but even in the Garden of Eden, some conflicts are still possible because some goods are scarce even in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there exist two scarce goods in the Garden of Eden. One is uh, the physical body of a person. We have, each of us has only one. We do not have an unlimited supply of physical bodies. And secondly, of course, the standing room where my body rests. So even in the Garden of Eden, it is possible that Robinson Crusoe wants to do something to Friday, to Friday's body, or Friday wants to do something to Robinson Crusoe's body. I do not have to describe what the possibilities are <laughs> in, in this regard, but it should be pretty clear that that possibility exists. And obviously, they cannot both occupy the same space. Um, if I want to stand on one place, the other person has simply no room to put his feet down at exactly the same, at exactly the same place. Um, so accordingly, even in the Garden of Eden, we would need rules that make 
peaceful cooperation between um, Robinson Crusoe and Friday possible? And these rules would be rules uh, laying down who has exclusive control over these scarce goods, over those things over which conflicts can possibly arise. Um, and in the real world, of course, which is characterized by all around scarcity, not just bodies and standing room is scarce, every, almost everything is scarce, um, we need, um, we need rules allowing us to avoid otherwise uh, unavoidable conflicts that determine who has exclusive control over what and who has not exclusive control over what. Now, um, if we go into the history of social and political thought, uh, there have been many proposals made um, and offered as solutions to this problem of social order. Again, this problem of social order is the problem, how do we make peaceful relations, peaceful cooperation with human, uh, humans possible given the scarcity of objects and the possibility of conflicts over scarce, uh, scarce objects. Um, and the fact that many proposals have been made has led uh, many people to believe that, that there exists no single correct solution to this problem of social order. Um, but in fact, there does exist a correct solution to this, and I have not invented this solution. The solution has been discovered uh, hundreds, actually thousands of years before it has been reformulated, refined, and so forth. But uh, as soon as I will explain it, you will recognize that it is a very, very simple, uh, a simple solution. Um, the solution is basically uh, the idea of uh, private property. Now let me explain first the solution applied to the Garden of Eden where the scarcity exists only with regard, with regard to scarcity of physical bodies and standing room. What rules would people most likely uh, accept as fair and just rules in order to avoid conflict in the Garden of Eden? Um, and then following that, I'll explain the rules that apply in uh, in the real world with all around scarcity. Now in the Garden of Eden the solution is simply provided by a rule that says everybody um, may place or move his own body wherever he pleases provided only that no one else is already standing there and occupying the same space. Everybody is the exclusive owner of its own body, can do with his own body whatever he wants. If somebody else wants to do something to my body, then he needs my permission. And if I want to do something to somebody else's body, then I need his permission. Um, I don't want to go into great detail, but you see, the alternatives that you could think of would immediately lead to conflicts. Uh, and again, recall, the purpose of rules is to avoid conflicts regarding scarce resources. Rules that do not avoid conflicts are not norms or rules, they are perversions. The purpose of rules is to avoid conflict, not to create it. Now, outside of the Garden of Eden, that is in the realm of all around scarcity, um, the solution is provided by four logically interrelated rules. The first rule is, as I already said, that would also hold in the Garden of Eden. Every person is the private, exclusive owner of his own physical body. You could simply ask, uh, who else? if not Robinson Crusoe, 
should be the owner of Crusoe's own physical body? Should Friday be the exclusive owner of Robinson Crusoe's body? Um, or should Crusoe and Friday own the body jointly? Uh, and the answer is, of course, that the alternatives do not avoid conflicts, they make conflicts permanent. Um, and the second rule is, every person is a private owner of all nature-given goods that he has perceived as scarce and put to some use um, before anybody else has done this. Um, and again, without going into a deep, sophisticated justification of these rules, which I can also give, I only appeal to your intuition. Uh, who else, if not the first person putting something that was previously unowned to some use, should be the owner? The second person? Uh, the first and the second person together, jointly, but that would automatically, again, lead to conflict, whereas if the first one is made the owner of it, he does so without running into any conflict because nobody else claimed these goods before. He was the first one. He appropriated them without any conflict. Anybody who comes later and then wants to have it would automatically, of course, run into conflict. And again, as I explained, the purpose of norms is to avoid conflicts, not to generate them. Um, the third rule is implied already in the first two. The third one is every person who, with the help of his body and his originally appropriated goods, that is, goods that were previously owned, were taken possession of by the first, the first time, produces now new products, thereby becomes the proper owner of these products, the exclusive owner of these products, provided only that in the process of production, he does not physically damage the property of other individuals. And the fourth rule, again implied already in the previous three, is once a good has been first appropriated or produced, ownership in it can be acquired only by means of a voluntary contractual transfer of its property title from a previous owner to a later owner. Again, let me just emphasize that anybody who just suggests different rules suggests essentially rules that do not avoid conflict but create conflict, uh, and that we in our daily lives, in our daily private lives, by and large adhere to these rules and recognize them as of course, what else could people possibly accept as fair, uh, as fair rules? Um, now, a few statements in order to emphasize these points. Um, contrary to the frequently heard claim that the institution of private property is only a convention, uh, it must be categorically stated that this is untrue. A convention serves a purpose, and it is something to which there exists an alternative. This is what a convention is. So the convention has a purpose, and if it's something is a convention, then there exists an alternative to it. To give you an example, um, the Latin alphabet um, serves the purpose of written communication, and there exists an alternative to it. We can also use the Cyrillic alphabet uh, that serves the same, the same purpose. Um, that is why it is referred to as a convention. The Latin alphabet is a convention. Uh, what, however, is the purpose of action norms, and I already pointed out what it is. Um, if 
no interpersonal conflict exists, if there is perfect harmony among mankind, you always do what I expect you to do, and I always do what you expect me to do, then we would not need any rules whatsoever. And there would be perfect, perfect harmony. Um, but since that does not exist, um, since there are conflicts, um, we do need norms, and it is the very purpose of norms to help avoid otherwise unavoidable conflict. A norm that generates conflict rather than help us avoid it is contrary to the very purpose of norms. It is, so to speak, a dysfunctional norm, or as I said before, it is a perversion. And with regard to the purpose of conflict avoidance, which is the sole purpose, so to speak, of norms, with regard to the purpose of conflict avoidance, the institution of private property is definitely not just a convention because there exists simply no alternative to it. If there are conflicts over scarce goods, the only way to solve it is to assign private property rights. I can control it, you cannot control it. You can control this and I cannot control that. Otherwise, we would always have to assume perfect harmony among all interests which simply does not exist. Only private or exclusive property makes it possible that all otherwise unavoidable conflicts can be avoided, and only the principle of property acquisition through acts of original appropriation performed by specific individuals at specific places and specific points in time makes it possible that conflict can be avoided from the beginning of mankind onward. Since only the first appropriation of some previously unappropriated good can be a conflict-free appropriation, simply because, by definition, no one else had any previous dealings with that particular good. Okay, now we come to the next important problem. Now, as important as the insight is that the institution of private property ultimately grounded in acts of original appropriation is without any alternative, given our desire to avoid conflict, it is obviously not sufficient in order to establish a social order. Because even if everyone knows how conflicts can be avoided, it's still possible that people simply do not want to avoid conflict because they expect to benefit from conflict at the expense of other people. In fact, as long as mankind is what it is, there will always exist murderers, robbers, thieves, thugs, con artists, and you name it. Hence, every social order, if it is to be successfully maintained, requires an institution or requires institutions uh, and mechanisms designed to keep such rule breakers in check. And how do we accomplish this task um, and by whom should this task be accomplished? So libertarians do not believe in, uh, in perfect man, a transformation of mankind. Quite to the contrary, we have a very real, realistic view of mankind. There are evil, bad people out there, and what is the, bad, the best method in order to check these people, to control these people, to bring people to respect the rules that I initially explained? Now, the standard reply to this question, how do we enforce these rules, is to say this task, that is the enforcement of law and order, as I described law and order, is the first and the primary duty, and indeed 
the reason for the existence of the state. In particular, this is also the answer that classical liberals, such as my own intellectual master Ludwig von Mises, has given. Uh, but whether or not this is the correct answer depends, of course, on how is state defined. Um, now, according to the standard definition, this is not the definition that I make up, that is so to speak to the generally agreed upon definition of the state. Um, the state is defined um, not as a regular specialized firm, rather it is defined as an agency that is characterized by two unique but logically connected features. The first feature is, and the decisive one is, the state is an agency that exercises a territorial monopoly of ultimate decision making. Um, that is, the state is the ultimate arbiter or the ultimate judge in every case of conflict, including conflicts that involve the state or the agents of the state itself. Um, just to see if, if, you have a, uh, if you have a conflict with a state agent, let's say a conflict with a policeman, who decides who is right and wrong in this conflict? Uh, the, the answer is given by a judge that is employed by the same agency as a policeman. Um, so this is, this is the essential characteristic of a state. It is the ultimate judge in every case of conflict, including conflicts involving the state and its agents itself. Um, and the second part that is already implied in this second unique characteristic is um, that the state is an agency that exercises a territorial monopoly of taxation. That is to say, the state is an agency that unilaterally fixes the price that private citizens must pay for the state's service as ultimate judge and enforcer of law and order. The state then also determines what is the price that you must pay for him to do this job of being the ultimate judge involving even conflicts uh, of state agents itself. Now, what are the fundamental errors of classical liberalism? I think they should have already become uh, uh, apparent by, uh, by defining precisely what a state does. So, as widespread as a standard view regarding the necessity of the institution of a state as a provider of law and order is, it stands first and foremost in clear contradiction to some elementary economic and moral laws and principles. First off, among economists and philosophers, there exist two nearly universally accepted propositions. The first one is, every monopoly is bad from the viewpoint of consumers, not from the viewpoint of producers. Every producer loves to have a monopoly. Um, I remember giving lectures to, to my students. Students always say, oh, you are working for free market institutes and so on. You must get huge amounts of money from businessmen. Um, the, the, the answer is uh, uh, b businessmen hate competition. Businessmen like competition in all areas except in the area in which they themselves operate. <laughs> there they would love to have, uh, have a monopoly. So that's why I say, from the point of view of a consumer, monopolies are bad. And why, why are they bad? Um, because, uh, let me just define first what I mean by monopoly in order to avoid any misunderstanding. Monopoly is here understood as, in, in the classical meaning, as an exclusive privilege granted to a single producer of a commodity or service 
or as the absence of free entry uh, into a particular line of production. Only one agency, agency A, may produce a given good or service X. Um, and such monopoly is obviously bad for consumers because it is shielded from potential new entrants into its line of production. And because of this, the price of the product will be higher than it otherwise would be, and the quality of the product will be lower than it otherwise would be. Now, the second proposition on which almost all economists and political philosophers agree is this. So monopoly is allegedly bad. Um, second one is, however, the production of law and order. That is, in short, of security, security of our bodies and our property, is the primary function of the state as I have just defined it. And security is here understood in the wide sense that is also adopted in the American Declaration of uh, Independence as a protection of life, property, and the pursuit of happiness from domestic violence <coughs> and from foreign aggression. Now, obviously, both of these statements are apparently incompatible with each other, inconsistent with each other. Monopoly allegedly is bad, but in this area of production of law and order, everybody seems to think there we need a monopoly. Now the fact that there is an inconsistency here has rarely caused any concern among philosophers and economists. Hardly anybody is even aware of this contradiction. Um, and insofar as people have recognized that there is some sort of contradiction that you cannot on the one hand say monopoly is bad and then on the other hand say but the state must of course be a monopoly of law and order, insofar as people have just recognized this, then they have typically taken the position that it is um, the, the first statement that might have flaws, that monopolies are not always bad, but the second one is certainly correct, that you need a monopoly state that produces law, law and order. Um, yet there are in fact fundamental theoretical reasons and mountains of empirical evidence that it is the second statement that is in error that we need a monopoly provider of law and order. Now, as a territorial monopoly of ultimate decision-making and law enforcement, the state is not just like any other monopoly, such as a milk or a car monopoly that produces milk and cars of comparatively lower quality and higher price. In contrast to all other monopolies, the state uh, not only produces inferior goods, but it produces bads, it produces non-goods. In fact, it must first produce bads or non-goods, namely taking something from people against their will, uh, or causing conflicts and then deciding the conflict in its own favor, in order to do any benefits that it bestows on other, on other people. Uh, to explain that in more detail, if an agency is the ultimate judge in every case of conflict, then it is also judge in all conflicts involving itself. And consequently, instead of merely preventing and resolving conflicts, a monopolist of ultimate decision-making will also cause and provoke conflict in order to settle it to its own advantage. You hit somebody on the head, and then you say, I did that because you deserved it. You looked at me in a strange way, and you call your judges to your help, and they will just say, 
absolutely right, that's the way it was. That is, if, if one can only appeal to the state for justice, justice will be perverted in the favor of the state. Constitutions and Supreme Courts and such things notwithstanding. These constitutions and courts are also state constitutions and state courts. And whatever limitations on state action they may set or find is invariably decided by agents of the very same institution that is under consideration. Predictably, the definition of property and protection of property will be continuously altered and the range of jurisdiction will be expanded to the state's advantage. That is, the idea of some given, eternal, immutable law that must be discovered will simply disappear and will be replaced by the idea of law as legislation, as something that is made up by the state, as arbitrary state-made state -made law. Um, to give you an give you an example, uh, when communism fell apart and people wanted to get their property back that had been uh, expropriated from, from them uh, during the communist regime, um, then they turned to the Supreme Courts in the so-called free Western countries, which allegedly protect private property. Do you think in any of these countries the Supreme Courts then decided, of course, all the property has to be given back to the previous owners? In none of the states that was decided this. In all of the states, the Supreme Court said, yes, of course, we protect private property, but you won't get your private property back. And if what you get is compensation, but the compensation has nothing to do with the market value. Um, would you ever imagine that a Supreme Court would come to the conclusion that, oh, since we are funded by taxation, we ourselves are an illegitimate institution. No Supreme Court will ever come up with, with an idea like this. Would you ever imagine that a Supreme Court comes to the conclusion we should limit the range of jurisdiction, the range of decision making that Supreme Courts have the answer, I have never seen a Supreme Court ever doing something like this, and I'm betting my life on the fact that it will never happen in the future. No. Moreover, as ultimate judge, the state is also a monopolist of taxation. That is, it can unilaterally, without the consent of everyone affected, determine the price that its subject must pay for the state's provision of its perverted law, whatever it might be. However, a tax-funded life and property protection agency is a contradiction in term. The, the state is supposed to be protecting our life and property, but how is it protecting our life and property by first attacking our life and our property? That is, a tax-funded life and property protection agency is a contradiction in term. That is, an expropriating property protector. Um, now, motivated as everyone else is by self-interest and by the fact that nobody likes to work, um, but equipped as it is with the unique power to tax, state agents will invariably strive to maximize expenditure on protection, and you can use almost the entire gross national product and pretend that you use it for protective purposes. Um, but, at the same, but at the same time, do as little as possible. The perfect position is um, you maximize expenditures, and you minimize actual work. Who wouldn't like to be in that position? <laughs> so these are the general errors of statism, so to speak. Now I come to the specific errors of democratic states. Most people think, of course, that democratic states are some 
great invention, great improvement. What I want to show is that democratic states are even deteriorations or as compared to what we had, what we had before. Um, the traditional pre-modern state form is that of an absolute monarchy. Um, yet monarchies were typically criticized, uh, in particular also by classical liberals such as Mises and so forth, for being incompatible with the basic principle of equality before the law. M monarchies rested instead on, on personal privileges. Uh, there were higher, law higher laws that applied to the king and lower laws that applied to the rest of the people, so to speak. So the critics of monarchy argued the monarchical state had to be replaced by a democratic state, um, by opening participation and entry into the state government to everyone on equal terms, not just to an hereditary class of nobles and so forth. It was thought and it was claimed that the principle of equality of all before the law had been satisfied. Now, however, the democratic equality before the law is something entirely different and completely incompatible with the idea of one universal law applying to every person in exactly the same way and everywhere and at all times. In fact, the objectionable schism between a higher law applying to kings and a lower law applying to regular folks, exists under democratic conditions just as, just as before. Um, it exists in the form of the difference between a higher public law that applies to public officials and a lower private law that applies to regular, uh, to regular folks. Under democracy, everyone is equal in so far as entry into government is open to all on equal terms, everyone can become king, so to speak, not only a privileged circle of people. Thus, in democracy, no personal privileges or privileged persons exist. However, functional privileges and privileged functions exist. Public officials, as long as they act in an official capacity are governed and protected by public law and occupy thereby a privileged position vis-a-vis -vis persons acting under the mere authority of private law. To give you examples, um, public officials, for instance, are permitted to finance or subsidize their own activities through taxes. If as a private person, I simply take your money out of your wallet. This is considered to be a criminal offense and I will be punished. If as a public official I come to you and do exactly the same thing, this falls under public law is considered to be a legal activity. Um, if as a private law I take you and beat you up and force you to work for me day and night, this would be considered kidnapping, uh, slavery, and whatever, and is, of course, a great offense. If I do that as a public official, then it is called public, public service, military draft, and things like this is perfectly all right. If, as a private citizen, I take your money and against your will and then give it to somebody else, this is considered to be stealing and fencing of stolen good. If I do that as a public official, then this, is, then this is called social policy or redistribution of income. Uh, from the point of those people who are affected by it, it makes absolutely no difference. So you realize quite clearly that there exists this difference between a higher law applying to public officials, functionaries, 
and a lower law applying to normal citizens is just as much preserved under democratic conditions as it existed um, under, um, under, monarch, uh, under monarchies. Um, you can say, so to speak, uh, privilege and legal discrimination and the distinction between rulers and subjects will not disappear under democracy. To the contrary, rather than being restricted to princes and nobles, under democracy, privileges will be available to all. Everyone can engage in theft and live of stolen loot if only he becomes a public official. <laughs> now, what you can predict then is that under democratic conditions, the tendency of every monopoly of ultimate decision making to increase the price of justice and to lower the quality of justice and to substitute injustice for justice is not diminished, but it is actually aggravated because everyone can engage in this. As, as a hereditary monopolist, now I come to some interesting differences between, monopoly, between monarchy and democracy. As a hereditary monopolist, a king or prince regards the territory and the people under his jurisdiction as his personal property and engages in the monopolistic exploitation of his property. Under democracy, monopoly and monopolistic exploitation do not disappear. Rather, what happens with democracy is simply this. Instead of a prince and a nobility who regard the country as their private property, a temporary and interchangeable caretaker uh, is put in monopolistic charge of the country. The caretaker does not own the country, but as long as he is in office, he is permitted to use it to his own advantage. Um, he uses, so to speak, the current use of the country. In, in Latin terms, he has usufruct, of, of the country, but he does not own the capital stock. Um, but this does not eliminate exploitation. To the contrary, it makes exploitation less calculating and carried out with little or no regard to the capital stock. Exploitation becomes short-sighted and capital consumption will be systematically promoted. Let me explain this by a simple example. Let's say I give you a house under two different conditions. In one case I say, I make you the owner of this house. You can sell the house in the market, you can pass it on to future generations. Um, uh, whatever you do to the house, you will see what happens to the price of the house in the market. And in the other case I say, here you have the identical house, and you are made for four years a caretaker of this house. Uh, you cannot sell the house, you cannot pass it on to whoever you want to pass it on, but for four years you can draw any advantage that can be drawn out of this house and, and use it for your own personal advantage. Now ask yourself, will you act differently in these two different scenarios? And the answer is, of course, of course you will act very differently. In one case, you will try to preserve the capital value of the house uh, for the reason that you might want to pass it on to a future generation or for the reason that you might want to sell it for as high a market price as you get. You will also take into consideration what are the repercussions of my actions that I perform with the house in terms of will this drop the market value of my house or will that increase the market value of my house. But if you just are four year, eight year caretaker of the house, you will give a damn what happens to the capital value of the house 
we will try to loot the capital value as quickly as possible because after four or eight years you have no chance whatsoever anymore to do it. So this is, this is one fundamental difference between the activities of kings and the activities of, uh, of, democratic, of democratic politicians. But there is even more, more to this. Um, under, under monarchy, it is perfectly clear who the ruler is and who the ruled are. You know that I will never become the king. Um, and because of this, every attempt on the part of the monarchs to just increase taxation, uh, rip you off more, there will be a resistance. Why does he do this to us? Um, under, mona under democracy, the distinction between the rulers and the rule becomes blurred. Uh, it exists nonetheless, but the illusion arises, we all rule ourselves. Uh, it is uh, uh, ruled by the people, for the people, um, of, the, of the people, All right, thank you. Um, and, you. And you realize that, oh, maybe I end up on the other side of the coin. So it, it's not very nice if they rip me off, but maybe tomorrow I will be the one who rips other people off. <laughs> and that is, so to speak, a consolation prize. <laughs> so you do have, there is less resistance against these types of attempts to continuously uh, rip you off. Another important difference is this. People say, Look, but democracy has the advantage. There's at least competition for the position of the rulers. And are we in favor of competition, whereas under monarchy, there's no competition. It's always clear who becomes the next king. And isn't that a monopoly? And wouldn't we have to just be opposed to that and be in favor of competition? Now, the answer to this is, yeah, competition is good as far as the production of good things is concerned. But competition is not good as far as the production of bad things is concerned. We would not want to have a competition who is the best prison guard, who is, who is the best murderer, um, who, is, who is the best demagogue, and so forth. There we are happy if we have dilettants doing the job, people who are entirely incompetent to doing, do, doing the job. So, we are not in favor of competition in all areas. We are in favor of competition in the production of goods, and we are against competition in the production of bads. To illustrate this a little bit further, a king comes to power by accident of birth. Okay, he might be a bad guy. There are many bad guys, many bad kings in history. Nobody will deny this. But first thing has to be considered is this. A king is, of course, expected by his own dynasty to just keep the dynasty alive. After all, there are family who want to in inherit this stuff. If the guy gets too crazy, then his own family will see to it that he will be surrounded by people who control him. And if that doesn't work, they will assign some close relative or distant relative to make the guy a cut a head shorter. Um, so kings were frequently killed because of these sorts of things. On the other hand, because he comes to power by accident of birth, kings are, of course, people who can be nice guys. Um, uh, just nice daddies, nice grandpas, and so forth, who do nice things and uh, are concerned about the wilderness and this and that, and leaves the people more or less, more or less alone. Uh, think of, uh, think of uh, a guy like Prince Charles, if he would, if he would be the absolute ruler of, uh, of Australia, I think he would definitely be an advantage of, over your current rulers. <laughs> On the other hand, if you ask yourself, how do, how do people rise to the top in a democracy? The answer is, you must be an intelligent bad guy in order to rise to the top. Um, imagine you would say, I will not, 
I will protect private property, I will not raise taxes, I will not engage in any type of redistribution. Those, I, I will abolish all types of welfare handouts. Um, what are your chances that you will rise to the top uh, in, in, in a big country? The answer is, you can forget it. Um, democracy is, so to speak, the guarantee that only bad people will rise to the top, and the more so, the larger the country is. That might not be the case in a small village of 100 people where everybody knows each other and they know how they acquired their position. But as soon as the masses of people are large enough so that nobody knows from whom you steal and so forth, the worst people will rise to the top. Um, last, last thing, and this then I end the first part of this uh, speech. To use a nice analogy between uh, democracy and, um, uh, and, and monarchy, uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart, some people asked me, how do you explain that in these East Bloc countries, um, even during peacetime, uh, life expectancy declined, whereas in all other countries, life expectancy rose. And I thought about it for a while, and uh, I came up with the following answer. Um, communist countries were a specific, specific form of slavery. Uh, slavery is defined by two characteristics, so to speak. On the one hand, uh, you cannot run away. If you run away, the slave, the slave owner can capture you and kill you, beat you, whatever he wants. And secondly, they can assign you to do certain tasks. So in this sense, we have two types of slavery. We have the traditional type of slavery that we know from, um, from the United States and many, many other countries where you have private slave owners. But Communist countries were fulfilling this definition of slavery just as well. Because if you tried to run away from East Germany, for instance, they killed you. Uh, you had to stay there, and of course they could also assign you to work. Uh, now ask yourself, would you rather, if you have no choice but to be a slave, would you rather want to be as privately owned slave, or would you want to be a publicly owned slave? And the answer is, of course, then if that's the only alternative I have, I prefer to be a privately owned slave every day, because my owner has an interest in preserving my value. After all, he wants to keep me healthy, he wants my life expectancy to rise, he wants me to have children, if possible. Um, uh, he will take me to the doctor. Um, and life expectancy of privately owned slaves rose by and large in parallel to the life expectancy of the free population. Um, slaves in the Soviet Union, where you did not own them privately, could rent them out in the private market and keep the money yourself, but you could nonetheless tell them what to do and prevent them from running away. You, ki you killed them en masse. Uh, you didn't do anything to preserve the capital value embodied um, in, the, in the slave. Uh, no private slave, no private owner of, of a cow, so to speak, uh, they will deliberately kill the cow, uh, but if it is a publicly owned cow, these cows will uh, en, masse, en masse killed. And this is precisely, again, what, what, democracy, what democracy does and promote. Uh, uh, with this, I end my first part of the speech, and as I, as I said in the uh, with a little break in the second part, I will now give the constructive alternative of how a society could work with, without this type of nonsense setup that I have described. Thank you.
Zur Ruhe bitte, Achtung, Achtung, as we Germans say. <laughs> um, so now I come to the solution. Before I explained the problems, now I hope to explain at least the outlines of the solution to the problem. Um, and I call this solution the idea of a private law society. Um, so if the state and especially the democratic state is demonstrably incapable of creating and maintaining social order, um, if instead of helping to avoid conflict, the state is a source of permanent conflict. Um, and if rather than assuring legal security and predictability, the state itself continuously generates insecurity and unpredictability through its legislation. And if the state replaces constant law with flexible and arbitrary whim, uh, then escapably, of course, the question uh, arises as to the correct and that must be uh, necessarily non-statist solution to the problem of social order. How do we enforce these rules that I explained at the beginning as efficiently as is humanly possible? And the solution to this is what I call a private law society. Uh, and a private law society is a society in which every individual and every institution is subject to one and the same set of laws. There is no public law that grants privileges to specific persons or to specific functions, and there is also no public property in such a society. There is in such a society only private law and private property equally applicable to each and every one. No one is permitted to acquire property by any means other than through original appropriation, through production, or through voluntary exchange. And no one possesses a privilege to tax or to expropriate. And moreover, in a private law society, no one is permitted to prohibit anyone else from using his own property in order to enter any line of production that he wishes to enter and compete against whomever he wants to compete. Now specifically regarding the problem that we want to discuss here, that is um, in a private law society, the production of security, the production of law and order, will also be undertaken by freely financed individuals and agencies that compete for a voluntarily paying or not paying clientele, just as a production of all other goods and services. Now it would be presumptuous wanting to predict the precise shape and form of the security industry that would emerge within the framework of a private law society. But it is not at all difficult to predict a few central changes um, that would fundamentally and very favorably distinguish a competitive security industry from the present and all too well-known statist production of injustice and disorder. First off, while in any complex society that is based on the division of labor, self-defense will play only a secondary role for reasons that I will come back to in a few minutes, um, it should be emphasized from the outset that in a private law society, everyone's right to defend oneself from aggression against one's person 
and against one's property is entirely undisputed. In distinct contrast to the present statist practice, which renders people increasingly unarmed and defenseless against aggressors, in a private law society, no restrictions on the private ownership of firearms and other weapons exists. Everyone's elementary right to engage in self-defense to protect his life and property against invaders will be sacrosanct. And as one knows from the experience of the not so wild, wild West, as well as numerous recent empirical investigations into the relationship between the frequency of gun ownership and crime rates, more guns imply less crime. Let me just say a few words about this because people are very confused about this. First, in the Wild West, that is in the time in the United States when the federal state did not really exist and practically every person was owning guns, contrary to what you see in many Wild West films. Um, there existed very small amounts of crime as com per capita crime as compared to what exists in the current United States. Imagine that you try to rob a bank and every bank employee has a gun. Um, <laughs> the likelihood that you will get out of this gun is practically zero. These sorts of things did simply not happen. These areas were relatively wild, but wild only in the sense that people were willing participants in, uh, in brawls. So if you did go to a bar um, and got into a fight, and then people went outside and sh uh, were shooting it out, that is obviously not crime. Uh, we would not interfere if Mike Tyson is boxing against Muhammad Ali, that they are beating each other up. These are willing participants in something like this. Those sorts of things existed in the Wild West, no question about it. But if you abstain from these types of things, the Wild West was an extremely safe place as compared with the present United States, which is a dangerous place, especially in major cities, due to the fact that increasingly more limitations were put on gun ownership uh, Whereas, of course, criminals do not care about uh, breaking the law. After all, that's why they are criminals. Um, imagine what would have happened if they would not have disarmed the entire British population in recent decades during the riots that you saw recently taking place in London. Do you think that the riots would have been as successful in terms of the damage that they would have caused if the British population would have been armed? I doubt it very much. If you look at countries um, that are heavily armed, such as Switzerland, where every male adult has an assault rifle in his, cab in his private cabinet with ammunition, Switzerland is one of the lowest crime rate countries in the world and is one of the most heavily armed countries in the world. The same applies also to uh, Israel as far as I know. I'm not as familiar with the Israeli case as I am with the, uh, with the Swiss case. Um, and uh, uh, there is a, f a famous uh, study with the title uh, More Guns, uh, Less Crime by a guy John Lott that gives ample uh, illustration of the fact that the easier it is in various states to, to have concealed weapons, the lower the crime rate tends to be. If, um, if you, I mean, just think of something like this. Um, there, there was a rivalry between two different towns in the United States. In one, in one town, they outlawed any, any ownership of guns entirely, and the rival town 
uh, uh, prescribed that people had to own guns. Um, no, uh, criminals are not nice guys, but they are not dumb. Um, so in what, in, in what town would you just uh, uh, build up your operation? Uh, that seems to be rather obvious. Um, th th this experiment was then basically outlawed by the federal government saying it's all right what that one town did outlawing uh, guns, but it is not all right what the other town did prescribing everybody to, uh, to own guns. In any case, um, but just as in today's complex economy, of course, we do not produce our own shoes and our own suits and our own telephones, um, but we take advantage of uh, the advantages that division of labor uh, offers. So we can expect that we will also do so when it comes to the production of security, especially the more property a person owns and the richer a society as a whole is. Um, hence, most security services will without doubt be provided by specialized agencies that compete with each other for voluntarily paying clients by various private police, insurance, and arbitration agencies. Now, if I wanted to summarize in one word the decisive difference and the decisive advantage of a competitive security industry as compared to the current status practice, this word would be contract. The state, as the ultimate decision maker and judge, operates in a contractless legal vacuum. There exists no contract between the state and its citizens. We do not have a contract that says I will do such and such under such and such circumstances. It is not contractually fixed what is actually owned by whom and what accordingly is to be protected. The state does not say you own your income. No, it says you make an income and I tell you how much you can keep and how much I will take. Um, it is not fixed what service the state is to provide. It is not fixed what is to happen if the state fails in its duty, nor what the price is that the, custom, the customer, so to speak, of the service that the state uh, offers must pay for this service. Tax rates are flexible. They don't say tax is this and never will be changed. They never ask us if they change it, if that is okay. No, none of these things are fixed. Rather, the state unilaterally fixes the rules of the game, the laws, and can change them by legislation during the game. Um, obviously, such a behavior is inconceivable for freely financed security providers. Imagine this. Just imagine a private security provider, regardless whether it's a police, an insurer, or an arbitrator, whose offer consisted in something like this. He would say, I will not contractually guarantee you anything. I will not tell you what specific things I will regard as your to be protected property. Nor will I tell you what I oblige myself to do if, according to your opinion, I do not fulfill my service to you. But in any case, I reserve the right to unilaterally determine the price that you must pay me for such undefined service. Now, now any, any such security provider would, be, would immediately disappear from the market due, com to a, due to a complete lack of, uh, of demand from the side of customers. Each private, freely financed security producer instead must offer its protective clients a contract, first of all. And these contracts must, 
in order to be acceptable or to appear acceptable by voluntarily paying clients contain clear property descriptions as well as clearly defined mutual services and obligations. Moreover, each party to a contract for the duration and until the fulfillment of the contract would be bound by its terms and conditions and every change of the terms and conditions would require the unanimous consent of all parties concerned. So again, the state, again, let me just emphasize, the state can, of course, just pass different laws as if you are just in, in, a, in, a, in a football game, in the middle of the football game, uh, the, the penalty rules will be changed. Um, in, in, instead of just agreeing on that, from the, from the outset or insisting, of course we can change it in the middle of the game, but only if we both agree on in which way they should be changed. Now more specifically, in order to appear acceptable to security buyers, these contracts must contain provisions about what will be done in the case of a conflict or dispute between the alleged protector or insurer and his own protected or insured clients. That is, if there is a client between the insurance company and the, uh, the, the insurance company and the, the client of this company, nobody would sign a contract unless there would be some ruling. What will happen in such a case? Um, and these contracts must also contain provisions. Uh, what will happen in the case of a conflict between different protecting agencies or different insurers and their respective clients. Everybody knows there can be also conflicts between different insurers. What will we do if there is a conflict between this insurer and that insurer? And each insurer will have to have provisions in its contract what procedure will be put in motion if that case arises, because everyone knows that case, of course, can arise also. And in this regard, only one mutually agreeable solution exists. In these cases, that is, where we have conflicts between the clients of the company and the company itself, or we have conflicts between different companies, um, the only solution that exists is that one then resorts to arbitration by independent third parties. Emphasis on independent third parties. Um, and these independent third parties that are then used as arbitrators in cases of conflict between someone is insured and the insurance company or different insurance companies, these independent um, third parties must be parties that are trusted by both parties to the conflict. Um, and in addition, um, these third parties are also freely financed arbitration agencies that again stand in competition with each other, with other arbitration agencies. The clients, that is, the insurers and the insured, uh, expect of these arbitrators, of these independent third parties, that they will come up with a verdict that is recognized as fair and just by all sides and only arbitrators that are capable of forming such judgments will succeed in the arbitration market because no arbitration agency can rely on the fact that it will be chosen in the next arbitration case again. You can turn to different companies if either of the conflicting parties is dissatisfied with the service performed by these arbitration agencies. Arbitrators that are incapable of forming judgments that are considered to be fair by all conflicting uh, clients uh, 
and they are, which are viewed as biased or partial will simply disappear from the market. I'll come back to, to this topic at, a little bit later again. Now from, from this fundamental advantage that is that there, are, that there exists a contractual relationship between uh, agencies that allegedly protect you and you who wants to be protected, a number of additional advantages follow. First off, competition among police and among insurers and arbitrators for paying clients would bring about a tendency toward a continuous fall in the price of protection per insured value, um, which makes protection increasingly more affordable, also for poor people, so to speak, whereas under monopolistic conditions, the price of protection will steadily rise and become increasingly unaffordable. I mean, what we pay for protection currently goes up every year. Uh, on the other hand, the protection that we are actually receiving gets worse and worse by ye from year to year. Um, furthermore, as I have already indicated, protection and security are goods and services that compete with all other goods and services. Um, if more resources are allocated to protection, uh, fewer resources can be expended on cars, on vacation, on food and drink, for, for example. Um, and also, uh, resources that are allocated to the protection of person A or group A, um, let's say people living on, uh, on the west coast of Australia, uh, compete with uh, resources uh, expended on the protection of people B living on the east coast of, uh, of Australia. Um, and as a tax-funded protection monopolist, the state's allocation of resources will be necessarily arbitrary. Why do they spend more on this uh, group than on that group? How much should be spent in total on protection? Uh, conceivably, you can uh, protect people by equipping everyone with, uh, with a personal bodyguard and a, a tank and a flamethrower put on, on, on top of it. Um, do we need that much protection? Or would be one policeman per thousand people with a stick be sufficient? How do we, de how we, do we decide these sorts of things? The market decides these sorts of things, how much milk we reproduce, who, who wants to have how much milk, where will the milk be delivered. Um, when it comes to states deciding how much to provide of what, to whom, they have, they have no rational way to decide because consumers do not buy these things. They make the decision for consumers of whose desires and needs they have not the faintest idea. Um, as a tax-funded protection monopolist, the state's allocation of resources is always arbitrary. Um, there will be overproduction or there will be underproduction of security as compared to other competing goods and services. And there will be overprotection of some individuals, groups, or regions, and underprotection of others. Of course, most of the protection will be for the state officials themselves. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they always make sure that they have plenty of bodyguards surrounding them, even though they should be the ones that deserve <laughs> to be <laughs> unprotected. <laughs> So in, in, in sharp contrast to that, in a, in a system of freely competing protection agencies, all arbitrariness of allocation, all over and under production would disappear. Protection would be accorded the relative importance that it has in the eyes of voluntary paying consumers. And it should be perfectly clear that people have very different demands in this. I mean, if you are Arnold Schwarzenegger, you don't need as many personal bodyguards as I need as a <laughs> relatively weak person, so to speak. 
Um, some old ladies might want to have more protection than, uh, than some strong young men. If you live in a uh, high crime rate cities, you expend more money on that than if you live uh, in the in the outbacks uh, uh, somewhere and uh, um, uh, and like Croco crocodile Dundee have, uh, know how to handle uh, knives and weapons in the perfect uh, perfect way. So protection would be accorded the importance that it has for different people at different places, and no person or group or region would uh, receive protection at the expense of any other one. Each and every one would receive protect protection in accordance with his own payments, the payments in accordance with his own desires. But the most important advantage of a private contract-based production of law and order, however, is of a qualitative nature. First, there is a fight against crime. The state is notoriously inefficient in this regard because the state agents entrusted with this task are paid out of taxes. That is, they are independent of their uh, payment is independent of their productivity. Why should you work if you are paid for doing nothing at all? Um, in fact, it can be expected that state agents take an interest in maintaining a moderately high crime rate because this way you can justify ever increased funding. Um, as a matter of fact, we know of course that, that the police employs all sorts of agents that act as agents provocateurs. Um, that is, that cause certain problems and then afterwards just say, hey, we need more funding in order to protect ourselves against these types of activities. Again, to give you an example from, from Germany, they are thinking about, again, out, outlawing some right-wing so-called Nazi party. The problem with that is, is this, uh, they tried that a few years ago and then they found out that most of the provocative actions based on which they wanted to outlaw that party were done by agents of the state that had been infiltrating this party. Um, and and then, then even the courts were too ashamed to just outlaw the party because the people, the people had been state employees who had been responsible for these types of activities. In fact, what we can expect is that state agents take, as I said, um, and even worse is for state agents, the victims of crime and the indemnification, the compensation uh, of such victims plays at best a very negligible role. The state does not indemnify the victims of crime. The state claims that it protects us from crime, uh, from murderers, uh, robbers, and, and so forth. But if it fails in that task, they don't do anything to just make good. Um, to the contrary, the harmed victims are still further insulted in making them, as taxpayers, pay for the incarceration and the rehabilitation of the criminal should he be captured. Um, the victims do not get anything from the aggressors. No, the aggressors are incarcerated. The incarceration of an American, a prisoner in America is for roughly $70,000 per year. Um, so these people can just play table tennis, complain if they don't get the right muesli for breakfast. Uh, uh, they can work out so that once they get back out, uh, they are next time a little bit stronger. Um, they, can even st they can even study law uh, in order to bring lawsuits against people who, uh, against the people who have in, in incarcerated, uh, incarcerated them. Um, 
there is no incentive, for instance, for the state police to find stolen goods. Ask yourself, is there incentive for an insurance company to find stolen goods? The answer is, of course, if I find the goods, I don't have to compensate them. Why should a policeman ever try to find stolen goods? Uh, it makes no, dif makes no difference whatsoever. Um, uh, private companies would have an incentive to prevent crimes, because if they prevent crimes, they don't have to pay up. Um, why would a state-funded policeman have an interest in preventing crimes uh, if they have no obligation to do any compensation afterwards? In that case, they rather hand out parking tickets, uh, drink coffee at 7-Eleven, uh, and uh, instead of engaging in dangerous things like hunting down dangerous criminals, uh, yeah, uh, they, en they enjoy life by doing things that are pleasurable, because everybody pre prefers, of course, to do pleasurable things uh, over doing dangerous, dangerous things. Um, private security providers, in particular insurers, as I said, because they have to indemnify their clients in the case of an actual damage, otherwise they would, of course, find no client whatsoever, um, they must operate in an efficient manner. They must be efficient in the prevention of crime, because otherwise they would have to pay up. Um, if a criminal act cannot be pre prevented, they must be efficient in detecting and recovering the stolen loot, otherwise, again, they would have to pay up, and particular they must be efficient in the detection and in the apprehension of the criminal, for only if the criminal is apprehended is it possible for them to make him pay for the compensation owed to the victim and thereby reduce their own cost. So all very, very different. Simply the incentive structure is an entirely different one than the incentive structure that is faced by tax-funded protection agencies. In addition, a private competitive and contract-based security industry has a general peace-promoting effect. Now, states are, as I have indirectly already explained, by nature aggressive institutions. They can cause and provoke conflict in order to then solve it to their own advantage. Or to put it differently, um, as tax-funded monopolists of ultimate decision-making, states can externalize the cost associated with aggressive behavior onto other people, that is, onto the hapless taxpayers, and accordingly will tend to be more aggressive vis-a-vis -vis their own population as well as vis-a-vis -vis foreigners. Uh, a, simple, a simple riddle. Um, would the United States have gone to war against Iraq if Bush and his cronies had to pay all the costs associated with it out of their own pocket? Um, the answer should be clear as daylight. If you can make other people pay for your own ridiculous aggressive policies, hey, you tend to be more aggressive than you normally would be. Um, so again, competing private insurers are by nature, however, defensive and peaceful. On the one hand, this is because every act of aggression is costly. And an insurance company that would engage in aggressive conduct would require comparatively higher insurance premiums. Uh, and that involves a loss of clients to cheaper, non-aggressive insurers. And on the other hand, it is not possible to insure oneself against every conceivable risk. Rather, it is only possible to insure oneself against accidents, that is, risks over whose outcome you have no personal control. Um, 
and to which you do not contribute anything. To give, for, for example, it is possible to insure yourself against the risk of death and the risk of fire, um, but it is impossible to insure oneself against the risk of committing suicide tomorrow um, or to burn down your own house. Um, similar, it is impossible to insure oneself against the risk of business failure. Um, if you could do this, I would insure myself and uh, then the next day I just m mess up my business and then I could collect the insurance premium. You cannot insure yourself against such things like this. You cannot also insure yourself against unemployment. I mean, there is something, of course, that's called unemployment insurance. But, you, but again, states invent, of course, uh, um, America defends America by attacking Iraq, even though no Iraqi ever attacked the United States. This is a completely defensive activity. Uh, so we, of course, also have unemployment insurance. Um, but unemployment is an, an uninsurable risk. All I have to do to get unemployed is go to my boss and tell him what SOB he is, and then I, then I lose my job, and, I, and the insurance company would be held responsible to help me out in this problem. Um, <coughs> it's also impossible to insure myself against disliking my neighbor. Um, for in each case, one has some control or full control over the event in question, the risk in question. Most significantly, the uninsurability of individual actions and sentiments in distinction to the insurability against accidents implies that it is also impossible to insure oneself against the risk of damages that result from one's own prior aggression or provocation. That is, I cannot insure myself against me going out and provoking somebody else or hitting him in the head and then saying, hey, now this guy is retaliating against me, come to my rescue. No insurance company would ever take on cases like, like this. Um, instead, every insurer must restrict the actions of his clients so as to ex exclude all aggressions and provocation on their part. Otherwise, they will simply not insure you. Uh, that is, any insurance against social disasters such as crime must be contingent on the insured submitting themselves to specified norms of civilized non-aggressive conduct. And further, due to the same reasons and financial concerns, insurers will tend to require that their clients abstain from all forms of vigilante justice, except in quite extraordinary circumstances, because Vigilante justice, even if it is justified, invariably causes uncertainty and provokes possible third-party intervention. And by obliging their clients instead to submit to regular and publicized and open procedures whenever they think that they have been victimized, these disturbances uh, that are associated and the associated cost with these disturbances can be largely avoided. So vigilante justice will not take place. The insurance companies will say, except in, under very circum unusual circumstances, there has to be an open investigation. Everything must be public so that uh, conflicts, sudden involvements of third parties, uh, can be reduced so that the cost of the operation of the insurance business can be, uh, can be lowered. Um, and by obliging their clients instead to submit to regular and publicized procedures whenever they think that they have been victimized, these disturbances and associated costs can be largely avoided. And lastly, it is worthwhile pointing out that while states as tax-funded agencies can and do engage in large-scale prosecution of victimless crimes such as illegal drug use, prostitution, and gambling, these so-called crimes would tend to be of little or no concern within a system of freely funded protection agencies. 
um, protection against such crimes would require obviously higher insurance premiums. But since these crimes, unlike genuine crimes, where you have really victims, uh, are crimes where you don't have any victims, uh, would simply not find any clients. Why should I just uh, pay higher insurance premiums uh, to protect myself against something that, that never victimizes me in, uh, in, any, uh, in any way? And even more, while states, as I have already noticed, are always and everywhere eager to disarm its population and thus rob it of an essential means of self-defense, private law societies are characterized by an unrestricted right to self-defense and hence by widespread private gun and weapon ownership. Just, again, just imagine a security producer who demanded of its prospective clients that they would first have to completely disarm themselves, hand over all weapons, all knives, all hammers, all saws, and whatever it is, before this company would be willing to defend the client's life and property. Now, correctly, everybody would think of this as a bad joke and refuse such an offer. So the company comes to you and says, I will protect you. But first, you hand over everything that you can use to protect yourself first. And then my protection will begin. Now, every normal person will say, oh, there is something really fishy going on here. <laughs> um, nonetheless, this is precisely what the states do, obviously. Now, freely financed insurance companies that demand that potential clients first to hand over all of their means of self-defense as a prerequisite of protection would immediately arouse the most utmost as suspicion uh, as to their true motives, and they would quickly go bankrupt. In their own best interest, insurance companies, on the other hand, would reward armed clients, in particular those that are able to certify some level of training in the handling of arms and charging them lower premiums that reflect the lower risk that they represent. In the same way as insurers charge less if homeowners have an alarm system or a safe installed, so would a trained gun owner represent a lower insurance risk. Now last and most importantly, a system of competing protection agencies would have a twofold impact on the development of law. On the one hand, it would allow for a greater variability of law. Let me explain this first. Instead of imposing a uniform set, uh, uniform set of standards onto everyone, as that is the case under statist condition, protection agencies could compete against each other not just by price, but also through protect product differentiation. There could exist, for instance, side by side, Catholic protection agencies or insurers applying canon law, Jewish agencies applying Mosaic law, Muslim agencies applying Islamic law, and agencies applying secular law of one variety or another, all of them sustained by a voluntarily paying cli clientele. Consumers could choose, so to speak, the law applied to them and their property, and no one would have to live under a foreign law. Now, on the other hand, the very same system of private law order and uh, private production of law and order would promote a tendency toward the unification and the harmonization of law, because the domestic, so to speak, domestic, Catholic, Jewish, Roman, uh, mosaic law, whatever, um, would apply obviously only to the person and property of those who had chosen this law. Um, canon law, for instance, would apply only to professed Catholics and deal solely with intra-Catholic conflict and conflict resolution. That is, with conflict resolution between two, two Catholics that are uh, 
voluntarily have voluntarily subject themselves to this canon law. Um, yet it is obviously also possible, of course, that a Catholic might come into conflict with a subscriber of some other law code, such a Muslim law code, for instance. Now, if both law codes reach the same or a similar conclusion, then of course no difficulties would arise. However, if competing law codes arrived at distinctly different conclusions, and they would definitely do so in some cases, then obviously a problem arises. That is, the domestic, the intra-group law would be obviously useless, but naturally every insured person would want protection also against this contingency, namely the contingency of intergroup conflicts. Everyone knows that can of course happen also. Uh, might be nice if, they, or if you are all Catholics and the problem would be very simple to be solved, but if we are not all Catholics, everybody knows then a conflict can arise between that group and that group, and they ca sometimes come to different, uh, different conclusions. Um, so in this situation, it cannot be expected that one insurer or the and the subscribers of its law code simply subordinate their judgment to that of another insurer and its law. Rather, as I have already explained before, um, in this situation, there exists only one credible and acceptable way out of this predicament. And that is, from the outset, every insurer would have to be contractually obliged to submit itself and its client to arbitration by an independent third party. And this party would not only be independent, but at the same time, it would be the unanimous choice of both conflicting parties. So the Catholic agency and the Muslim agency would go to a third independent, unanimously agreed upon uh, agency that determines now the conflict that they have regarding who is right and who is wrong in the case at hand. And it would be agreed upon the third party because of its commonly perceived ability to find mutually agreeable, fair solution in cases of intergroup disagreements. And if an arbitrator failed in this task and arrived at conclusions that were perceived as unfair or biased by either one of the insurers or their clients, this person or this agency would not likely be chosen as an arbitrator in the future again. And as a result then of this constant cooperation of various insurers and arbitrators, a tendency toward the unification of property and contract law and the harmonization of the rules of procedure, evidence, and conflict resolution would be set in motion. So again, it's important to realize that the vari a variety of law codes does not at all exclude a development towards, toward a harmonization of laws as soon as it comes to conflicts between these rival law codes, quite to the contrary, there is a pressure to then develop universal law codes that apply, so to speak, to all these different law codes that are applied to, in, to uh, uh, internal groups. Uh, so a tendency towards the unification of property and contract law and the harmonization of the rules of procedure, evidence, conflict resolution would be set in motion. So in, in buying protection insurance, every insurer and every insured becomes a participant in an integrated system of conflict avoidance uh, and of peacekeeping. Every single conflict and every single damage claim regardless of where and by or against whom, would fall exactly in the jurisdiction of one or more specific insurance agency and would be handled either by an individual insurer's domestic law or by the international or universal law provisions and procedures agreed upon by everyone in advance by agreeing on third-party arbitration. 
And so as a result, instead of permanent conflict and injustice and legal insecurity as we have it under the present status conditions in a private law society, we would get the highest degree of peace, justice, legal security, um, and, uh, and, safe, and, uh, and safety. Thank you very much.